Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. In China, the third plenum of the 18th Central Committee of the Communist Party of China ended its meetings last week with some important decisions. Some of these decisions drove stock market prices around the world up. The investment community obviously was rather pleased with what was uh, decided and announced. Now joining us to talk about what took place is Min Chi Lee. Min Chi is an associate professor of economics at the University of Utah. He's the author of The Rise of China and the, De the Demise of the Capitalist World Economy. Thanks for joining us, Min Chi. Thank you, Paul. So th there was a, a, quite a few decisions made. I think it was something in the range of 60 decisions uh, that were announced, but, mm -hmm. uh, but a few were rather big and important. So let's start with what you think is the most important. Well, it appears that the overall message is that the Chinese Communist Party has decided the Chinese economy is going to move farther in the direction of privatization, liberalization, and the deregulation. Uh, maybe that's what makes the uh, capitalist investors in the world very happy. And then one of the key sentences in the decision is that the party is committed to have the party, uh, to have the market, to play a decisive role in the resources allocation by 2020. So that suggests uh, the, the Chinese government probably would move the economy farther in the new liberal direction. So what, what are examples of this? I know one of the things that they talked about was they're going to uh, change the way interest rates are set, the way, the way banks play a role. I mean, what is it now and how is it going to change? Well, it appears that the uh, most important part of the transformation would have to do with the further privatization of the remaining state-owned enterprises. So the uh, decision, uh, part of the decision has to do with the deregulation or liberalization of the public utility sector and the energy sector. Uh, the party has also decided that the private capital would be welcomed in the partial privatization of state-owned enterprises by making investment uh, in sectors uh, where the state has made investment. And then there's also the decision that the private in capitalists now are allowed to set up small or medium-sized banks. And then in the banking sector, actually, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about possible further liberalization of the interest rate in the future, but uh, no detail is provided in the decision itself. The, the decisions that got a lot of publicity were the one child per family policy is going to be liberalized, if I understand it correctly. If you have two parents and they both came from one child families, they're now going to be able to have two. And this is a move in a direction of liberalizing this. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing that made a lot of noise in the press was the uh, issue of closing down or restricting the use of labor camps for re-education. Uh, I guess this is something that came out of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, the, the, the other sorts of things, they're, they're going to let farmers own their land and sell and trade it. It's, up until now, land has been most owned by, by the state. But, but in previous interviews, we've discussed something, and, and, and I want to get kind of at a kind of more underlying issue here. The issue of de developing a stronger domestic market in China, being less reliant on being a cheap labor export economy, this all has to do with raising wages in China. Um, if you reduce the role of the state and you have more and more free market, how is that going to lead to higher wages? Do they, or do have, is that not a, an objective here? Uh, that, that's something I'm wondering now. And there's nothing in the decision that would suggest uh, the party cares very much about the possible income redistribution that is in the favor of labor. And instead, it appears most of the decisions are targeted towards raising the income for the capitalists. And so that will be against uh, the possible macroeconomic and the social rebalancing of the Chinese economy. And by, by reducing the role of the state, and particularly in the banking sector, they, they seem to be going more and more to essentially and actually an American model of capitalism, which is not some great success here. Yes. And uh, one of the surprising things is that there's no reflection of the failure of global neoliberalism in this party decision at all. And of course, uh, in one of the decisions, it does say it's going to raise the dividend payment by the state-owned enterprise uh, to the government, which is supposed to be used for social welfare. Uh, but that is actually going to be quite insignificant. Uh, the overall Chinese economy right now is between 50 trillion to 60 trillion yuan. And then the total 
before tax profits from the state-owned sector right now is only about 1 trillion yuan. So it's only about 2% of China's GDP. And then the state-owned prices pay already pay about one-third income tax on their profits. So if you uh, just uh, take about 30% from the after-tax profits, that may be just 0.5% of China's overall GDP. So that's not going to really increase the social welfare a lot. Now, what are the implications of this on the global economy? I know the stock markets all went up because they all love the idea of, you know, liberalization and capital can go wherever it wants and more rights for private investors in China. But when you look at the Toronto G20 that took place a few years ago, and we've heard this in other places, but one of the one of the things in the in the statement that came out of the Toronto G20 was urging China to raise demand. And they specifically talk about wages needing to go up in China because if, if the world's too dependent on America and, and Western Europe to be the main sources of consumer demand, it's when you get tailspins in, 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 in these countries, then China suffers, but so do these countries suffer. And they, everybody wants the Chinese market to expand. And of course, the Western guys love it if Chinese wages go up. They never talk about their own wages going up. Mm -hmm. But if, if this doesn't get addressed, and clearly they, they're going in the opposite direction here, well, then what's that mean in terms of the global economic crisis? Well, I'm worried that given China's current economic structure, uh, the mass consumption will continue to lag behind, especially if the waves uh, do not catch up quickly. And so mass consumption will continue to lag behind. So that would mean the Chinese economy will continue to be excessively dependent on investment. So at a certain point in the future, and this kind of overinvestment model would be unsustainable. Of course, the environmental conditions will continue to deteriorate. So if these trends continue, we could have a combination of economic, social, and environmental crises, say 10 years down the road. Now, the Chinese uh, recently announced that they think they're going to actually surpass the United States in, in gross consumption, in terms of the amount of dollars spent on consumer goods. Um, what do you make of that? Have you heard that? And what do you make of that? So it depends on the what kind of measure you use. If you use the purchasing power parity, then the overall size of the Chinese economy is going to exceed the U.S. in a few years. And if you take the measure of market exchange rate, it's going to take a few more years. Uh, but in any case, within the uh, macroeconomic structure of the Chinese economy itself, it continues to depend on investment for about 50% 50, 50 of its overall growth. Yeah, I mean, if the economy is growing and, and surpasses the United States, but if it's still based on cheap labor export of goods, it doesn't change the, the fundamental problem. Yeah, it will be unsustainable. All right, thanks very much, Minchi. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.